Hello and welcome to Say Hi to the Future, a podcast aimed at highlighting the human side of ingenuity. My name is Ken Tenser, CEO of Spiderworks, a leading business consultancy for mid-market organizations and entrepreneurs globally. With me today is Anna Aragon, founder and CEO of Autistic Thoughts, a company dedicated to raising awareness and acceptance towards autism. Like this video if you enjoy our show and subscribe to our channel. Leave us a comment with who we should interview next. Thank you for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the show. Anna Aragon, welcome to Say Hi to the Future. Thank you so much. It's nice to be here. So Anna, you wrote something recently. You said different perspectives bring different ways of thinking and feeling and different ways of thinking and feeling bring innovation and excitement. Tell me more about that. It's a wonderful quote. Yeah, I'm a big believer that different people with different characteristics bring a new set of innovation and ideas, not just into companies and businesses, but just in general, into our lives, in our personal life too. I just think that when you have a group of people that look the same and think the same and speak the same, it ends up being something that does not allow a space to grow and a group to grow and think from different perspectives and try to develop themselves and try to evolve. So I like to surround myself with people that think differently from me. And sure, I have many people as well that are more similar to me and that we have the same interests and that we think in similar ways. But I feel like a healthy balance of both is really needed in order for you to be able to, yeah, become the best version of yourself. And these different people will also bring different sides of you and will allow you to get to know yourself better and see the world in a way that maybe you'd had never dreamed of. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that difference brings innovation and creates exceptionality. I, I, I think I agree very much with that. As somebody who's focused on innovation for decades, I, I don't think anyone could have said it better. So thank you for that. Um, let's take a step back, though. What, what is autism? Because we, we hear about it. Um, I have very direct experience through family with it. But... It's not one thing. It seems to be, we talk about a scale or a range. So what is autism and what is that scale? Right. So the way I like to explain it, um, and I tend to explain it in a very visual way, so I'll try to explain it in this mean as much as I can, is that being autistic is having human characteristics taken to their extreme. So, and that's why some people sometimes say things like, oh, we're all a little autistic. No, that's not true. What you're saying is we're all a little human. Sure, we all have a small number of set of characteristics, but as an autistic person, when you are intelligent and exceptional, you are exceptional to an extreme. And then when you have sensory issues, you have sensory issues to an extreme. And when you are loud or quiet or shy or this or that, is the extremes. And that's why we tend to be described as too much, too little, too this, too that. So that's why there's also autistic people that have a set of characteristics and another autistic person has the exact opposite of that set of characteristics and they are both just as autistic. It's because of those extremes in any characteristic. That's how I would define it. Since it is a lived journey for you, I mean, tell us about the journey. When do you do you wake up one day and somebody says, oh, you're autistic? Do you do you find your way into the diagnosis? You know, just tell us a little bit about the, that, you know, from you personally. Absolutely. So, yeah, I have many clients. So for each of them, it was differently. But for me in specific, um, I moved to England when I was 18 by myself because I had always been what autistic people tend to describe themselves as so the black sheep in every group and family settings and everything I always felt like the odd one out and I thought that moving to England would magically fix that um, and <laughs> it didn't so when I started uni here I got quite diagnosed and I, I got a really strong sense of like okay there's something here that I'm missing like a 
piece of the puzzle of my life that I'm really not understanding. And then um, I searched for help. And thankfully, that person that supported me very clearly saw that I was autistic and helped me get diagnosed and supported me with that, which I'm thankful forever for. And I was around 19, which is really early on, especially for a woman um, to be diagnosed. So I'm really thankful for that. But it was hard. I had never heard of autism before in general. So it was a learning curve. And I was studying a film degree. And now I'm a developmental psychologist. So <laughs> it did take me on a very large life turn, let's say. But I'm glad it did. It, it brought back into focus the fact that what I want to do is help people and that this is my purpose this is why I was always different so I can have this community and really yeah help other people that have been through similar situations because I did the journey I know what it takes mm -hmm. so when you talk about the journey um again I'm going back to direct experience with a member of a family um their journey and and they've gone through a a very recognized journey, a lot of support. It would not allow them to be a development, developmental psychologist or partake in an interview. So again, is 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 there a scale or is there just something that people miss in 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 um, illuminating, you know, the skills that you, you do have, the remarkable skills you do have? Yeah, there's definitely, uh, well, diagnostically, and I'm a diagnostician, so I can speak about that. Diagnostically, there is a scale. It's not a scale we tend to announce to people um, unless they're quite young. But what we tend to describe things as is uh, low support needs and high support needs. So that's usually the scale people tend to refer to. Um, I am more on the low support needs, which still does not mean that I don't have support needs. And like people that are autistic that present more like me, we still have tools and different sets of characteristics and different ways of thinking. But when you think about autism, it's important to understand that the whole brain is rewired, no matter where in the spectrum the person is at. So sometimes that rewiring looks really different. And for some people, it brings characteristics like being pre-verbal, which means the person um, doesn't really speak or doesn't speak in more than a couple of words, or it comes up in extreme empathy, or it comes up in like quite low empathy and having a hard time putting yourself in other people's shoes. There's a lot of stereotypes, but again, it always goes back to those extremes that I was mentioning. So if someone is on one side of the extreme, that means there's another autistic person on the other side of the extreme. And that's right. kind of how it goes back and forth. What are some of the steps, though, that a family and then the individual, I guess, can take to support? Because it seems like, in, in, you know, you, you talk about the black sheep. To me, it, it's, it's, it's just a different way of thinking. And to your point, diversity in thought begets incredible breakthroughs. So... <laughs> it's kind of up to all of us to leverage the diversity in thought. So what are what are one of the two things that you you can do or a family can do to support somebody who's autistic? That's a big question. I think there's a lot to that because um that is a big part of what I do for a living. Like when it comes to families, I work with adults too, but when it's the families, is literally that like how can I support this person that I love and I'm trying to connect with? Um the main way is just, and this is hard, but just putting your biases to the side. Mm -hmm. What works for you as a person is not necessarily going to work for your autistic loved one. And asking questions, but also giving them space, try to understand that all behavior has a reason and that we are not doing things just for the sake of it. Sometimes we need time to unwind. Sometimes we are really overcharged. Sometimes we're trying to get support and we don't know how to ask for it. There's always a reason why someone is behaving the way they're behaving. So punishing them for being the way they are is not the way to go and forcing them to change. It's about mm -hmm. explaining the whys. For us as autistic people, the why behind things tend to be really important so having the patience to explain these things like 
why do I need to say good morning every day? Well, because it makes other people know that you're awake and that you're here with us. And being there to explain these things to an autistic loved one and being open to that and not assuming they know it is the first and one of the most important steps, although there's so many too that are important. But yeah, I would say that. Thank you. Um, and how, Anna, how has all this led to... Um autistic thoughts you know, tell us about autistic thoughts tell us about your journey to it and what you hope to to achieve yeah absolutely so um it's quite a funny one I feel like most people start like this maybe not who knows but for me I I used to work in schools um and the educational system just really didn't work for me uh, and I worked with autistic people, but even within that system, they didn't want to adapt to me as an autistic employee. And so once I became a counselor and I could do my own thing, I just I started doing a home appointments and just helping people in their homes and seeing children in their homes and families and everything. And, and that was just something I was doing myself. And like everyone else, then COVID hit. Um, <laughs> and I had to transform my practice into a virtual practice, which eventually led to the whole company because that really worked for me. And I was able to see adults as well and develop a bigger practice. And then eventually I added people to a team and we started diagnosing people. So we kind of just grew from there, from my mm -hmm. private practice into like a whole company where we help quite a lot of people now which is nice it, it, it is um so you go into people's homes whether it's in real life or in virtual covid life what what are some of the things that you look to help them with what are some of the things you can recommend to help somebody to make their day-to-day -day life um i guess easier would that be yeah absolutely um I tend to call it going from playing life in level extra, extra hard to level easy to medium. That's pretty much okay. it. Um, yeah, it's everyone is different. So people have really different things that they want to talk about and tools they want to gather. But the, the bulk of it, and this goes for most people, is we help people connect to themselves in a way that they hadn't before connect to not just their mask and to who people want them to be but their true authentic neurodivergent and autistic self mm -hmm. recognize who that even is go there and then once you are at that point where you can see yourself for who you are learn to trust that learn to trust yourself accept the parts of your brain that you need to accept your emotional side that comes from your brain and is really needed and that is communication. It's your brain's only way of communicating with you, accepting those, being able to stop once you do see them, these emotions, these feelings, and then think through them and react as you want to react. So that capacity to actually take control over the things you can control, accept the things you need to accept. So then you can trust yourself, know you're someone who's capable, know you're someone who makes good decisions and that you can take that with you for life. Also know that you will make mistakes, but you'll be able to recognize them, that there's space for that, that there's space for you to learn from them because you're human. All of these things are just, yeah, what I like to call going from old templates to new templates, just changing the way you view yourself in life. That tends to be the most important thing people take out of it. And, and are there some common triggers that you see when when working with people when working with them around their families like where 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 does the process start when you engage a family or an individual yeah again it really depends because different people had really different life experiences but there are definitely common triggers I would say that yeah that feeling that I was mentioning of being the odd one out or the black sheep tends to be very common amongst autistic individuals and the way autistic people process trauma is really different from the way neurotypicals do. So there tends to be a lot of nuances there. And autistic people tend to have, before connecting to themselves, a really negative view of themselves. And there's names that are very typical of us to call ourselves. Like we tend to say, 
we are silly or stupid or this or that. And it's just sad because that's the idea that the outside world gave us about ourselves. It's not who we really are. We're really capable of individuals. Like most people that invented anything were autistic. Einstein was autistic. And when you start really connecting to that and really understanding that you have all of that capability, all of that exceptionality, all of those other names you're calling yourself don't make sense anymore. And you can truly see yourself and your potential for who you really are and what it really is. And that's freeing. But yeah, that that's negative self-talk and feeling like you're wrong all the time and that there's something wrong with you. It tends to be a very big trauma and stigma and trigger that most autistic people unfortunately have. And how does that carry over to the workplace? I mean, as an employer, um, how do we recognize the benefits of neurodivergence and what they bring versus, oh, this could be a challenge. We might need to rethink our workplace, our workplace environment, are there health or safety risks? Like, you know, as just as you say, you know, you didn't completely become aware of it, you know, till, till teenage years, late teenage years. As employers, how do you start to break the barrier down for people who may never have, um, you know, be in their 40s or 50s and never have come across or experienced autism? Absolutely. And that's a lot of what I try to help companies do when it comes to that one-to-one -one training between us and companies is, again, putting your biases on the side also making people aware that there's a lot of neurodivergent people are not even that are not even aware they are neurodivergent themselves. And that's important to realize too. But those people need just as much support as the people that have been diagnosed and that are aware. So it's about breaking those biases down, see each person as an individual, and asking questions, making sure you are open to them and their experience, that you're not forcing them into certain boxes. And then actually realizing that people that think differently from you, again, like we said at the beginning, bring that innovation that you're not being challenged in a negative way by any means that being challenged sometimes is something that companies need. And a lot of companies say they need it, they want it, but then when it push comes to shove, they get really scared of it. And it's like, oh, we've always done things this way. And I think that's the most detrimental sentence anyone can say. So it's really about being open to that change and being open to the fact that different people will think differently from you. And also realizing that a lot of autistic people and ADHD as neurodivergent people in general are really solution-oriented people rather than problem-oriented people. So being open to their solutions, being open to what they have to say, I think is the best thing a company can do. And it can bring so much and just making people feel heard and seen and like they belong in the company is really important. And especially for autistic people that tend to like working from home, not everyone does, but mm -hmm. a lot of my clients have that as one of their adjustments. It's important to still make sure that that person feels included and they have people they speak with and that they still feel part of the company per se, because again, we tend to have that's something we carried around for so long that whenever we feel like it's being repeated and we're being left out, it feels really triggering and it's really intense. So yeah, being inclusive to the person and open to their solutions and ideas. So in terms of solutioning, because I, I think what you said is really important that um, autistic people tend to be more solutions oriented, which rather than problem oriented. And frankly, <laughs> there's so many problem driven people in organizations who love, who love barriers, love creating barriers. So I mean, there's obviously a tremendous benefit. So if an organization wants to um, hire or onboard autistic people like in, in a planned way, rather than, oh, that person turned out to be autistic, whatever, you know, I think, I think you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, um, like what is, them. yeah, what what is the first step? Is it like a foot in the door? Like hire somebody autistic, understand what it means, understand what they can do, understand how to support them, and then move from there? Is that 
the first step as an organization? I think so. I think that if you want to attract autistic people, it's important that not just the outside image is speaking about neurodiversity, but the actual culture represents it. Um, a lot of clients, when we are trying to speak about job offers and if they should go for a, a job or not, we tend to go and speak with different colleagues and see what they say about the company. And there are certain words that we pick up on. So if they say things like it's quite competitive, that's probably not a good fit for an autistic person because there's going to be a lot of pressure. Mm -hmm. If they say things like um, you are expected to be like a team player and have excellent communication skills, it's not that we won't necessarily have those characteristics, but as soon as we hear it, alarm bells go off and we feel really, um, or we tend to, and most of my clients tend to, feel really like intense about this wording so I would say avoid this type of wording in the description for example for mm -hmm. a job opening and saying things about yeah being open saying things about the fact that you'd send interview questions advan in advance just demonstrating that you actually are trying to not just trying that you are actually inclusive and that you want different people to apply from the get-go is really important and again very simple things can achieve that saying you'd send the interview questions saying that you're happy for the person to do the interview virtually saying that you are happy to provide adjustments it tends to be something that as soon as you see these as an autistic person you relax a little and you're like, okay, maybe this could be for me. So, and it sounds like as an employer, um, I gain the advantage of, of a team member that's reliable, thoughtful, and step-based focused in yeah. problem solving. Is that? Uh... She's not a bad deal. <laughs> no, no, it's not. So I just wanted yeah. to, so did I capture that in the right sort of, yeah, as autistic people, we tend to like meaning and purpose, mm -hmm. especially in our job role, because it is such an encompassing and takes so much of our time while we are alive. And we enjoy dedicating time to things, actually putting thought into them. Mm -hmm. And again, that search for purpose and meaning is so important that if you get an autistic person and they are really dedicated to the job and they really see what their role is contributing and they really feel capable in their job, like there's no stopping them. Mm -hmm. Again, like the fact that, yeah, all of these amazing historical figure, figures that we love to speak about were all autistic, like Leonardo da Vinci, Nikola Tesla, Einstein like they were all phenomenal and they needed small adjustments in order to be phenomenal and that was just fine no one speaks about the small adjustments no one speaks about the fact that Einstein couldn't work while he had socks on but as soon as he took the socks off he explained gravity to us which is something that is quite important to understand so it's about that providing those small adjustments so you can have the most spectacular person in your team because they will be well, and and I think too, um, they they want to know why, um, yeah. they want to know why they're in the room, why they're doing what they're doing, and frankly, um, a lot of groups don't do a great job at asking why. They don't figure out the purpose on day one. So it seems like there's a lot of reverse learning. Um, yeah. that, that we are we, the why group, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, like I was mentioning at the beginning, like between families in jobs, anything explaining the why's to us so important. And if you explain the why and we really get it, we'll never forget that again. Like we'll never forget that task. We'll never forget that routine because we understand the why. Right. So tell me about some of the, um, you know, the the, the courses uh, that your organization offers and. The takeaways that you provide at, at Autistic Thoughts for, for a company? The most popular ones that we have are the general understanding autism because it gives a really good and in-depth understanding of autistic people and employees and how to best support us in general, how to attract autistic employees and not just attract them and then trap them into your company, but really support them and make sure that they are 
happy and fulfilled within their roles. Um, and that's a really important one because it goes pretty much into everything. Um, and then we also have an autism and communication one that is really popular on how to express yourself and communicate with autistic people and how to again put your biases aside while you're speaking to this person how to ask questions in ways that make them feel comfortable how to be unassuming um and that is a very useful one as well i would say mm -hmm. it tends to have yeah the most uptake because of that, because it's such an important skill. We are all different. We all speak differently. We process information differently. So figuring out where you can help yourself and them is the most important thing, I think. Um, so yeah, I'll say those are the two best ones, <laughs> if I'm biased, but... <laughs> well. It's okay to be biased when they're when they're great offers. So um, thank you for that. And it's amazing. You know, when I listen to that, I'm thinking, again, so much reverse learning that we can do, because those are some of the questions that I think we all should be asking of ourselves or of our team members. So um, Anna Aragon, Autistic Thoughts. Uh, we're nearly at the end of our time. We say hi to the future today. It went by very quickly. So thank you for that. Um, last question. What... Uh, what does the future hold? What do you wish for? What do you want to bring to the world? Yeah, well, on that's less on my autism side. It's more my ADHD side that hears that question and is like all of the ideas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I don't like ideas, I must admit. Yeah, right now we started like really diagnosing people and helping them through this process with support uh, alongside the diagnoses and everything, which is lovely and has really been working. Um, we are expanding the team as well, which is very exciting. But my next steps are starting to teach other professionals um, how to speak to autistic people as well, not just companies, but yeah, going into professional side. Um, also start training other professionals like me on how to diagnose other people, just like giving the tools and sharing that. I don't want to gatekeep anything. So that is definitely where we're going as well soon. Um, and I will have my own book coming out soon wow. at some point too. So yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> well, again, Anna, thank you so much for your time. Keep in touch. Let us know when the book comes out. We love to do catch-ups with our guests and it will be great to speak to you again. So thank you for being part of this. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's been lovely. Thank you.